Hey everyone, Allison Needle here from Kanu to Love. We have to be transparent with everybody. We have been trying to YouTube. In this podcast, we really want to YouTube. But we are having some technical difficulties beyond our control. But we are in process and we are trying to make it happen. So our goal is to have the podcast eventually on YouTube. So hopefully in the next few weeks you'll start seeing us instead of hearing us so thank you for tuning in with us today this podcast is very dear to us and we hope it encourages you and blesses you and maybe you might have a tear or two come as i might find one coming we want to talk today about the journey we had with our daughter and if you didn't know um our daughter is turning five actually next month she's turning five and through her adoption journey, and I, I can't believe I'm saying this, it was over a 12-year process, a 12-year-long journey. And as I reflected the other day, I thought, you know what? I think that journey even started longer before that. But we, all that being said and done, it was a beautiful, a beautiful testimony. And I hope that if you're an adopted family out there listening or a birth family listening, I just hope this really touches your heart because I'm going to tell you, God has his all in control. He has the perfect timing for your baby to be born and join your family. Our birth parents have the perfect timing for your, your baby to be born and the perfect family to raise your baby. He's got it all. So I just want to encourage you today and Let me share you our journey. Well, I think I should start off by sharing a little bit about Ethan's journey, just a little bit, to kind of set the stage. Um, We went through three years of agonizing fertility treatment. Ethan was truly a miracle baby. He um, he was our last attempt. I mean, our last attempt. I mean, we. I mean, I went through surgeries. Not to be totally like transparent, but I'm gonna let you know surgeries we went through all the in vitro went through every kind of medication you name it been there done it and I gave up I just was like this is not happening I mean we had people praying for us we prayed I just gave up I was exhausted physically spiritually emotionally and if you're battling fertility and you're going through fertility I used to say I was going through fertility I look now it was really battling it um I, I just encourage you all the way through I feel for you I just bless you. It is hard. It is really hard. But God's got a plan. He really does. But anyway, um, it was our last attempt. I mean, literally, we were, I was, it was done. No more. No way, Jose. Absolutely done. Finished. Spent. You know, just didn't give a rip. <laughs> the best way to explain it. So, my mom, bless her heart, she was one of these gals that just had a way to present something and I just said mom I'm done we had heart to heart and she said mom uh, just try one more time for me I'm like, oh, okay so we did but also during the process we started investigating adoption and we were investigating a Christian international agency he approved accredited and we were looking to a Korean adoption And in those times, it was back in 19, it was about 2000, let's just say 2001. Okay, so we started looking, really kind of peeking around adoption in the late 90s, but this was occurring in 2001. So we were looking into investigating adoption in Korea. And what would happen is they were flying the babies to where we were living at that time, it had been JFK. So your social worker would fly in with the babies internationally, you'd go JFK, pick up your baby, come home, that'd be that. I was like, oh, that's great. Perfect. All right. So we started investigating. So we went through the last IVF, in vitro fertilization, if you don't know what that is. And I remember saying to the doctors, we're going through the last attempt. Now, mind you, we we're already filling out paperwork for adoption. So we're kind of moving along with that. We're still doing the IVF. And I remember saying to the doctor, because um, they only would transfer two embryos, because they seen too many miscarriages for triplets. Well, for the cycle, we had four embryos that um, survived the 
different days. There's different technicality that I can bore you with. But anyway, um, so we had four embryos that could be transferred, basically. And I said, can we just do three? Let's do three. You know, I knew you say two, because I'm not coming back. I'm done with this. We're all finished. And he said, well, let's just, uh, just do four. I was like, what? So we did. We transferred four embryos, and um, our son was the one who survived. It was a miracle in itself. Um, we miscarried, I think, um, through the whole, I think I counted like 18, 19 babies from the in vitro. So anyway, so he survived. But we, in the meantime, we didn't know we were pregnant, and we met with the adoption agency social worker, and she's sitting down with us at the kitchen table and just saying, you know, if you do find out you're pregnant, you know, as we're going through this process, you know, as we're getting ready to go through this Korean adoption, um, you do need to tell me because we have to have you step back and give somebody else your place. So, oh, honey, I said to the social worker, if that was the case, we would not be sitting here at this table. Well, I didn't know I was pregnant. So about two weeks later, we got the news that from the um, in f- the fertility center that we were indeed expecting. And a couple weeks later, I went to the first trimester. Was there, I contacted the agency, and I said, um, I want to thank you guys so much, but we just found out we're expecting, and I guess we had to give our place up. So that was it. So let's fast forward. Our, we have a healthy baby boy born November 2001. When he starts to talk, when he was roughly a year and a half old, so we're looking at 2003, he starts praying, God, give me baby brother. So we're really all excited. We're so excited. We're like, yes, God, we we know we feel in our hearts we're going to have another child. So we start, you know, a little preparing and we weren't able to conceive again. We started going back to the fertility centers. We actually went to two different ones this time. Nothing happened. We did not do in vitro because various reasons. We just didn't feel peace with it, and we just didn't have the finances, and we just didn't feel that unction because when some things you know you're supposed to do, you're supposed to do. This time we didn't get that. So time was going on. Nothing's happening. Now Ethan's even more verbal as he's getting older. Now his prayers are beefed up. God, give me one baby brother, two baby sisters. I'm like, whoa. So, Okay. All of a sudden, when Ethan was roughly four, that's our son, something dropped in my heart, and I said, Dave, what, don't we, what do you think about maybe adopting through China? So we started investigating that route, and we actually did all the paperwork, we did our home study, we were having all the paperwork done for our dossier, dossier is the paperwork internationally that the government you're adopting through has on you, so they have all the information. Well, we're doing the paperwork, and our government loses our paperwork. And we pray a lot. We're praying family. So we prayed and prayed, and we're just trying to get clarity, and we cannot get any peace about it. And at that point, I was involved with healing rooms. I was in healing room ministry, and I would ask the people I prayed with, I said, guys, can you give me confirmation what you're getting? Well, no, we can't do that. I also, you're not supposed to do that. So my one partner I always prayed with, I said to him, let's take it outside. Pray with me and tell me what you get, because I just want some confirmation. And he looked at me like, eh, eh, no. I said, that's what I'm getting. And I said, I kept feeling like there was a tidal wave coming down on us. So, anyway, to make a long story short, our agency and our social worker at that time could not find our paperwork. Our government lost our paperwork. It was like a black hole. Our paperwork just disappeared. Couldn't find it. Didn't know what to do. And I just said to Dave, and we had a talk. We didn't want to do this. But we said, I don't think we're supposed to go through with this. So, after the government, again, lost our paperwork a month I think six weeks, eight weeks come by, and we just finally said, we're done, you know, we'll just bow out. It's, it's not meant to be. And when we did, we felt such peace. But five days later, I get a call from the supervisor, my, su- my um, social worker supervisor, and she said, your paperwork showed up. Your paperwork's here. She said, do you want to go forward? I'm like, I don't think we're supposed to. She said, I don't blame you one bit, then that's fine. So we just, you know, didn't want to back out but we just felt the Lord said no you're not supposed to do this so fast forward now about four or five years Ethan's now in fourth grade I'm in my kitchen I'm homeschooling him at the time and I'm just in my own business and all of a sudden the Lord as loud as could be said to me go get your daughter and I thought what okay 
and I'm in, in my heart and my spirit, I'm feeling, which way? North, south, east, west? What, where, where are we going? Where are we going? And nothing. It was silent. <clears throat> so we went back to the agency that we were looking into because that Chinese adoption was a different um, agency we were looking into. So we went back to the one we felt led to that was going to walk with us for the, the babies back before Ethan was born for the Korean adoption. So we contacted them, praying it through, trying to get peace. Now we're older than we were before because quite a few years have passed. So countries that we originally would qualify for, the doors are shut. And also, when you're older, some of the countries do not allow you to adopt a certain age bracket. You'd be looking at an older child. And a lot of countries that we could have qualified before were not as expensive. Now these other countries that we do qualify for are, are a little more expensive. So we're praying, you know, like which way are we supposed to go? And, and there, you know, it was, again, a little more limiting. So we finally prayed and we figured, okay, I think we're supposed to do Russia. So I contacted our social worker and she said, okay, it's great. I'll connect you with a family <coughs> pardon me, that you can talk to for Russia. So we did. We talked to this family, and she explained her journey, and I thought, wow, that's awesome. We're excited. This is great. Perfect. And I talked to a couple of their families who adopted as well, other roots. So we're, we're sitting down now the next day with the um, social worker, sign the paperwork, everything's ready to go, and we're ready. The day after we signed the paperwork, the day after we signed this paperwork, we're all ready to go, we get a call from our social worker. She said, Russia has closed the doors for adoption. You, we cannot adopt through Russia. <laughs> like, what? You gotta be kidding. So, we're back to square one. And we're just not getting peace about what country now. I mean, we just feel like doors were closed. And again, the Lord said, go get your daughter. And I'm just like, ah, oh, which way am I going? So, at the time, our pastor at our old church, he said, well, my friend's who adopted why don't I connect you with them and you can talk to the wife and see what they did I said okay great so through email I was in contact with this gal and she connected us with an adoption brokerage so they were in California and Dave talked to the brokerage for about I don't know how many hours a couple days later I talked to the, the contact there as well like three hours the day after and we're feeling, okay, this must be the way to go. But it was this domestic adoption. And where we lived at that time, we were really very concerned about adoptions domestically. We've seen many, 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 many horror stories about adoption domestically. And that was because where we lived, it was through the system. And I hate to say that, but I have to be honest. We saw and heard a, a lot of bad you know, adoptions where the parents would come back. It was just really heartbreaking situations. And I said, no, we're not going to do that. But with this, um, this friend, the one that connected us with the brokerage, she explained that with adoptions domestically, as an adoptive parent, you do have rights. And you can have an adoption plan where you do not have to see the birth parents. You can decide what kind of adoption you want. And you can be very clear. You don't have to have them come in out of your life. But have communication. Maybe you can have it internet through the email, through the agency. But just some way that the birth mother can see the child. But the person, the family does not have to escort in and out the family. You know, so there'd be some kind of balance. And we would feel peace. So I said, oh, okay. So I had a lot of questions about that, obviously. But after talking to the agency off and on and just really being reassured and encouraged, and they understood where we were coming from, because this agency, actually, they're called a brokerage. The brokerage all were adoptive parents, and they've all been through it. So they understood. Currently, the trend in our country is open adoptions. So with that being said, everybody's going to lead to adoption with the open that birth parents can come in as often as possible. Well, we appreciate that, but in our hearts, we didn't feel comfortable with that. So we worked through that. But anyway, that's part of the adoption plan. In our minds, we had it set out, and we had it, you know, it wasn't going to be closed, but we were saying that the, we like to have the adopted mom, whoever she ends up being, that she could get communication to us 
through the adoption agency. So that's what it turned out to be. Okay, so let's get back to where we left off. Now, we started the journey. We signed the paperwork with the brokerage. We had to get a home study in our state. So we are onward. Things are moving along. We continuously are praying. And we're continuously waiting. Because we, when you do a home study, you have to do a home study every year. Because you need to do an update to make sure nothing's changed. So this is the year 2013. And all of a sudden, actually the, the journey started in 2012 to be honest with you. But it's a year later. And we already did our, our one home study and we did our home study update. And I had a dream. I had a little dream about a little boy and his name was James. And he looked just like our son. And he said to me, Mommy, Mommy, that angels call me Thomas Thomas. Well, Thomas means twin, twin, twin. And I said, oh, no. Oh, no. Well, and he said, oh, but I told them my name's James. And that was a dream. And I thought, wait a minute. We're supposed to, supposed to get a girl. God, you said go get my daughter. What is this about this boy? And I thought, well, okay. So I put it on the shelf and moved on. But I did start getting prepared for a boy with that dream. I thought, well, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I missed it. Maybe it's a boy we're getting. Okay. So early of fall 2013, we ended up moving to Tennessee. So we had to get a home study update because when you cross state lines, you have to get a home study in the state that you live in. So we did that in the January 2014. So we ended up moving again. We just got here and we moved again in March 2014. So now we're in an apartment. We're building a house in another portion of the town we lived in. So we had to get our home study updates because that's now the yearly annual update of May 2014. Well, all of a sudden these dreams start up again because I had a dream about this little boy James after I heard the Lord say, oh, you're going to go get your daughter. Okay. In the summer of 2014, I had a dream that I was holding a baby girl and I was chasing a woman and it must be the birth mother. Um, I think she was going to up ramp of a highway with this little baby girl. So the Lord's talking already in my dreams like, you think you're getting a boy and you're really not digging this idea because you're really in your mind preparing for a boy. It wasn't registering it for a couple months. On the September the 21st, 2014, I'll never forget it. I was sitting in our apartment and I was sitting on the sofa and it was quiet. I was just tinkering on my computer I think I was working on something for a youth group I don't remember now and all of a sudden the Lord said to me and again it was so clear but yet gentle like a whisper your daughter has been conceived her birth birth mother was raped she will be born in California and you're going to receive a suddenly hospital phone call and that was it I mean I had people when we were living in this apartment, say, oh, yeah, your daughter can come, and you can live in the apartment, she can be in the apartment. I was like, eh, I don't think so. Because I asked the Lord, and he said, no, she's not going to come until you get into your house, especially when she's just been conceived in September. Well, in fall 2014, this friend of mine, the one that connected us with the brokerage, she had a dream. She said to me, Allison, you're going to get a girl. So I just had a dream. I just was in the hospital, had my second son. Well, she adopted two little girls and a little boy. She said, I was in the hospital, had my second son. And I said to you, because Allison, you're leaving this hospital. You had this little girl dressed in blue. And because you were expecting to get a a boy, but but you got a girl. And I said to you, how did you do that? I said, oh, it was easy. So anyway, she was right. Because remember what the Lord said. She said, he said, you're going to get a girl. Go get your daughter. So after this dream my friend had, I had two dreams. So this is apparently, I would say like November, I mean December 2014. I saw her daughter. And she had dark brown hair, blue eyes. And she was about maybe eight, ten months old. She was crawling. She was in that crawling stage. And I was holding her, and she was not letting me hold her. She was fussing, and she was crawling, and she wanted me put down. Then she, you know, she just got down the ground and took off. And that's exactly what she was like at that age. Then I had another dream. She was about, I'd say about 10 years old. 
and I saw her clear as day. I saw her dark brown hair and her eyes, which are now hazel. But I saw her and what she, what she was going to be looking like. So Lori gave me these dreams saying, yes, your daughter's coming. So I'm telling you all about these dreams. I'm telling you about everything we experienced so that this can encourage you. Okay. That your children, I'm telling you, your babies are coming. They are. Well, I don't know about you, but we have found, and I've had so many people give me testimony. When a baby's entering your life, the Lord gives you a name. Some people may not agree with that, and that's okay. We found out with our son. I mean, he gave me a, ring, a name, and it rang. I mean, with his name, I, I was just all of a sudden looking at a picture of a couple of friends of ours, little boys. And I saw this little boy, and his name was Ethan, and all of a sudden the name rang, and that was it. And next thing I know, he, he was conceived and born. Well, all of a sudden, I'm hearing this name, Joy. And I thought, Joy, that's a beautiful name, but I can't name our daughter Joy. And I'm telling Dave, we can't do that because our friends... Friend's little girl who just was adopted from China. She is called Joy. It's not her first name, but that's what they call her. And I said, we can't do that. So at the same time, I'm seeing a name, and it started with an M. Well, with our family, we have had um, dogs. We're, we're a dog family. And we've had Maggie, Molly, Morgan, and Megan. Now, at that time, when we were waiting for our daughter to be born, we were through the adoption journey at that point, our dogs Maggie and Molly already passed away, but we still have Morgan. Oh, and Megan. That's right, Morgan and Megan. Morgan and Megan were still with us, and I thought, oh gosh, I can't have another M name. Oh, I can't do that. So I called this friend. I said to her, "Listen, pray and see what you get. What what name do you think? What are you getting?" And she said, "Okay." So she calls because I keep seeing this M name. I was like, "Gosh, I can't do another M name. That's that's crazy." So she calls me. She says, "Her name's gonna be Madeline." I saw. Right in the middle of the second, I said, her name's going to be Maddie. We're going to call her Maddie. Hung up. And that was it. So her name was going to be Madeline Joy. So, lo and behold, that's what happened. So, I tell you what. It, it, I, I had to share something. And I was debating about sharing this. When you're journeying adoption, another portion of it is that you will know when your child's born, just like, with the adopt, I know with our brokerage, they have a sense when different couples, babies are born, when they get hospital calls, they all know it. It's, it's God used these people in the most beautiful ways. You're going to know when it's your baby. You'll know it. It'll ring. It'll, you'll know it. It'll just be a piece. It'll be something about it. And we had, through the years, like I don't know how many potential opportunities. And every time... We would try to move forward. But honestly, we were trying to be compliant and thinking, you know, maybe this is it. We would pray and pray. And as we prayed, the Lord said, do not move forward because that is somebody else's child. And if you move forward, you'd be like kidnapping. I said, whoa, we don't do that. <laughs> no. So for us, that was always the Lord telling us, no, 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 no. Because we would have a house full. But we know that's not right because that's somebody else's child. So when your child comes, it will make sense. It will flow. It will ring. It will you'll be peace. It will all make sense. Okay, so back to Maddie's story and her journey. So it's about now March 2015. And we just now finished building our house because we were living in an apartment. And we moved into our house. And now the Lord has already told me that the baby wasn't going to come when we were in the apartment. He said, when we were in our house. And I asked him, I said, where, when's she coming? And he said, June. Now, if you think about it, she was conceived on September 21st. So theoretically, she should be born in June. That'd be nine months. So here we are in March. We had to go through, again, our one-year update. It's May. Fast forward two months. May 2015, we go through our one-year update. We have another potential baby born. I can't remember that baby was born, but anyway, another one. The Lord just said, no, it's not your child. You know, so we went through another one. So we're like now almost in June. And at that point, I actually think I forgot the Lord reminded me the baby's going to be born in June. 
because when you get sometimes you get through a journey you, you get like in a place some people get so hope deferred and that's understandable but we just we just encourage families do not do that there's a reason the babies don't come at certain times we don't know until that little one's in our arms and it makes sense so here's may we're going through our one-year update again and we're like okay mm-hmm. and we're kind of getting we're getting at this place it's over three years we're waiting because we started this thing in about march april of 2012 so here we are it was a sunny warm afternoon it was a Monday, June 22nd of 2015. Ethan and I are hanging out. He's doing these achievement tests, and I'm sitting there proctoring his test, and life is going on as, you know, usual. And all of a sudden, my phone rings out of nowhere, and it's the brokerage call me. And the gal call me, dear woman, her name is Dawn, and she's explained to me on this phone call about a beautiful, perfect little baby girl born the day before on June 21st, which was Father's Day that year. She was born in California. Dawn explained to me all about her birth, the birth mother's information, all her background information. And of course, she's sharing me about our daughter. She was six pounds, 10 and a half ounces, 20 and a half inches long. She stopped breathing after she was born. She was in Nick view turned blue after she was born. You know, all the, the stats, her APGAR score, all tests, she didn't test positive any drugs in her system, you know, all this information. How soon can we get to California? Are we interested? And all I can say is yes. That's all I can say. The brain, mouth are not working at this point. So Dawn said to me, okay, I'm going to present your information, your families, to the birth mom, and I'll call you right back. I said, okay, great. So I said to Ethan, Oh my goodness, I think your sister's been born. He looked at me, he's like, that's not my sister. <laughs> and the reason being, after three long years, that's all you can do is just guard your heart. Because there's been so much heartbreak in the journey, but there's been also a lot of joy. So I called Dave and I told him what's going on. I said, listen, you need to start looking into airfare hotels. How fast could you get home to pack? So, <laughs> and I think he just kind of froze in his chair, kind of like the day I called him to find out we were pregnant with Ethan. He didn't move for hours. <laughs> I think it was like that again. So I called my friend, the one who connected us with the brokerage, and um, I explained her thing was going on, and I, I told her to call her back because <laughs> I needed some help here because my mom, who lived with us at that time, she was in Florida visiting friends, so I had a house that needed a sitter, and we had three dogs at the time who needed somebody to watch them. So I think it was about an hour, I mean, no more than two hours passed. It felt like eternity. I mean, really waiting for that call back to say, get ready to come for, uh, to California, or I'm sorry, you know, it didn't work out. You know, it's just that waiting's the hardest part. It's like, well, it's been three years, what's an hour? It was like eternity. So finally, just like, oh, I can't take this anymore. So I think I, it was maybe two hours. I called back. And of course, I got their machine, naturally, you know. So I, I think I left a message or something of like, I, just please call us back so we can sleep tonight. That's all. Either way, it's fine. Just let us know. Maybe one minute, maybe the max, the phone rang. It was Dawn. She said, oh, I noticed you called. I said, yeah, we just want to know one way or the other so we can all sleep tonight and, you know, so as we can get on with life. She said, well, I'm so glad you called. You were chosen. How fast can you get here? And of course, I'm numb. I can't even talk at this point. My brain was just... <laughs> It wasn't, it was, maybe it was working, but the mouth was, and I don't know. And Dawn explained that the birth mom asked Dawn to pick the best family for her baby. So God used Dawn to pick us. So Dawn's explained all this information. The hospital, the social worker's name is going to be waiting for us at the hospital. You know, what do we need to bring? You know, all the information that we need. And, of course, she's checking me, you okay? You okay? And I can't talk, honestly. I, I think I was babbling. I, I couldn't even tell you. I, I have no idea. I, I just remember a couple of times saying, is this normal? Because <laughs> I couldn't think. It was just overcoming this moment. After over three years waiting, it was finally happening. And it was just overwhelming. So I called my friend back after we got on information. After, yeah, first, I called Dave. That's right. I called Dave. I said, you've got to get home now. We had to fly. We need the airfare, we need a hotel, we need to get a car rental, you know, we need to get out of here. We need to 
wash. I'll start washing. We have to pack. We have got to get out of here ASAP. So I call my friend back. She found the um, house and dog sitter. And thankfully, thankfully, my friend, I mean, literally, she saved my hide. I don't know if times I said this about her. She saved my hide. I had bought clothes for a baby girl that was bigger because you never know. Sometimes these babies, they're not born small these days. I mean, I've heard of some whew, big babies. So I bought like a zero three size. Well, our daughter, as I told you the stats, she was, you know, six pounds, ten and a half ounces. So she was newborn size. So our friend bought baby bottles, formula, clothes, socks, diapers, onesies, everything we needed. I mean, she just took care of everything. I was so thankful. I can't even begin to say thank you to her enough. I was so, I couldn't even verbalize. I was blown away. So then finally we called my mom to let her know, congrats, she's a grandmother again. And to stay in Florida. Because she was going to try to come home. I was like, no, stay in Florida. So I immediately, I start washing, start packing, packing for the baby. And our house sitter arrives and she's helping us get ready and packed up and get through the groove of what to do when we're gone. You know, the routine. So three in the morning, the next day arrives and we're on our way to the airport, flying out from Tennessee to Chicago, then Chicago to California. We finally get to our daughter. But a warning to adoptive families who are adopting newborns, be cautious, use wisdom when it comes to flying with baby formula. <laughs> oh, I was flying out of our airport and they pulled me aside because I had a, an unopened canister of baby formula. Now you can probably thought what they thought of me. So they, Chris, they, they, they stripped everything, all my luggage, my baby bag. You know, I have a car seat there. I'm carrying a car seat. We'll talk about in a YouTube coming up what to take with you when you travel to pick up your baby. But use wisdom, and you may want to rethink carrying baby formula with you as well as baby powder. <coughs> Pardon me. Because it does set off TSA, and you might be asked to take everything out of your suitcase. I wish they did. So, anyway. All that for a canister of formula. And they let me go with it. Go figure. All right. So anyway, back to our daughter. So we arrived in San Diego is where we landed. And um, we I feel like we sailed. Sailed to the hospital, to NICU, to meet the social worker. Her name was Linda. To fill out all the paperwork and, you know, <coughs> pardon me. So she could check and make sure who we were. Everything was, of course, perfect. She brought us to the NICU. And I'll be honest with you, I fell to my knees. And I think the only reason that I did not burst out in tears because there was a room full of other nurses and I just didn't want anybody to think I was a hot mess and he just never knew. So I just remember the instant motions, these emotions and the memories of all the dreams that God gave me in the millisecond. It was overcoming and overwhelming joy love elation it doesn't mean to touch i mean this overcoming love just going and gushing through my heart it was just overwhelming i can't even verbalize there's no words to explain it was like having an encounter with god all over again and it was just amazing so i'm on my knees just weeping as i'm seeing this baby I'm seeing her all hooked up to wires and monitors and, and gadgets. Because remember, she stopped breathing, so they're monitoring her so closely. And she was so tiny. And I thought she looked so frail, so teeny-weeny. <sighs> and then I held her. And the first time I held her, oh my goodness. She was the strongest baby I ever held in my whole life. That little frail baby, boy, she pulled one on me. She sat up, lifted her head, looked all around. I've never seen anything like it. I said, my goodness. Dave held her, and she just snuggled into his chest, just like daddy's little girl. And then Ethan finally had a chance to hold his long, prayed-for baby sister. It was amazing. I've never seen so much joy over one fella in my life. You know, the Lord said to us years ago, for the siblings, the siblings who are waiting for their baby brothers or sisters, this is a special request. God told us years ago, it's your job to pray in and pray for your siblings. So when you're praying for your siblings, 
please be very clear <laughs> what you, what God is telling you to pray for. Ethan used to pray for the fruit of the Spirit for her, and she does. She has it. But one thing he didn't pray for is calm, and that's okay. We're all different. But it is your job as the older siblings to pray for your brothers and sisters who are coming. But back to our girl, back to our daughter. She was absolutely just blowing our mind to all these years of waiting, praying. And there she was. The night we were leaving, the first night, so this is Tuesday, June 23rd. We're getting ready to leave. And Dave's rocking her to sleep. And the nurses already told us they were absolutely amazed because they tried to get our daughter to sleep. And they tried. And here he just sat there and rocked her to sleep and she fell asleep. And I had to say, we were just so moved by these nurses. They were so loving and encouraging and caring. You could see their and feel their hearts. They were melted. They just melted. Every time we talked to them about our daughter, because they referred to her as their princess, because she was the only baby girl, and then NICU, the, all the rest of them were little boys. And they just had this loving attitude. They had so much love in their hearts for us, for and Maddie's forever family. It was just so beautiful. I can't even verbalize. It was just such a loving, loving time. This woman named Estrella, who was Maddie's uh, nurse, she was kind of like a granny to Maddie. She has so much love for Maddie. She would show us how she was able to get her to burp because Maddie was a tricky burper and how she would get her to sleep, even though Dave did the best job. <laughs> he was the one that nailed it. But she was just so loving and sweet and encouraging so wonderful. So we came to California. We were told that the birth mother at that time did not want to see Maddie or see us. And that was fine. But I think she, um, she changed her mind. Cause after we left that night, we got a call from the hospital that she actually came to visit and that was fine. But it was a little confusing to us because we didn't understand what's going on, but our agency said it's okay because it's just a part of the process. It's their processing and trying to let go. I said, okay. So we were in the NICU for five days. It was five days when a baby, at least at that time, is born and there's complications. You stay for five days. So through the five days, the nurses were so kind when we would go home at night, they would call us and give us updates and let us know when Maddie fell asleep and where it was going on. And of course, we would call and get updates. It was just really beautiful, beautiful situation. So we're looking at the Friday. It was Friday, June 26th. But this is the target date that we were going to be discharged. And you see, was it the night before? The night before we got, a, um, I guess, a notification that the birth mother actually wanted to meet us. So this is Thursday night. And she wanted to meet us the day after discharge. So we went, we shopped. We found a card, which was the hardest card I ever bought in my life for this young woman, and we, Ethan thought, we'll get an ice cream gift card, that'd be fun, I said, okay, sounds great, we got her a gift card, just to say thank you, and you just never, you just don't know what you've done, just express our thankfulness, so we're all ready for that, so the day of our discharge, which was like the longest day ever, because Maddie had to go through tests to be sure, um, when she was getting ready to go home, they put them in the car seat to make sure that it wasn't too much stress on them. So it was called a stress test. So we had to go through that and had to wait for the pediatrician to come along and check her out, make sure she could fly. And, you know, so it was a long day. So through the waiting, the head nurse pulled me aside. And I didn't know if something was wrong or what was going on. And so she pulled me in one of the rooms off to the side and she said, would you do this again? I said, yes, absolutely. We would love to have a house full. But we know we're to focus on her right now. And she cried. The head nurse cried. And she explained that they see all these beautiful babies born. And she, they all know, she knew, and she, all these nurses know what these children's lives are going to be like after leaving because most of the babies are born to young unwed couples. And it's nothing against them as couples. But they say they know their lives and what it's going to look like. And to see Maddie going home to her forever family. It just melted their hearts. And they were so happy and overflowing with joy. And this nurse, she just cried. 
So for us, it was just so moving to hear this. And again, all that love, all that love from these people, these nurses who never knew us, and all the support and encouragement, it was priceless. It was just absolutely priceless. So all, I forgot to mention, through all those five days, running back and forth to NICU, we also had to um, fill out quite a bit of paperwork that was necessary in order for the birth mother to sign off on her parental rights. A social worker had to meet with her and explain, you know, legally what her rights were and to eventually sign off on them. So the day after discharge, when we were meeting her, and she decided where and, and when, which was just perfect, she was going to have a 15-minute meeting with us to meet us and hello, goodbye, and that would have been it. Um, before that meeting, she was going to meet with the social worker to sign off on her parental rights. So that was great. Because after that point, then the interstate um, compact can begin, which is the paperwork between California, Tennessee, California where Maddie was born, Tennessee is where we lived, the two states talk, so we get clearance that we can leave California to come home with, with our daughter. So, anyway. So these are pieces when you do adopt, and your different states are involved. This is different technicalities and red tape that we all have to go through. So I bring that up for just that reason. Okay, so back to our birth mom. It was, a, again, Saturday afternoon. Um, Maddie's just about, well, she's six days old, <clears throat> and we um, meet the birth mom in a mall in San Diego. And I just remember the moment we, we saw her, um, she had her boyfriend come with her. I just remember holding this girl. I mean, she could have been our daughter. It was just such a moving time. And it was absolutely, I can't even, it was just absolutely moving. You know, there was so much love there. And I think for her, maybe it was a time that realized that she made the right decision, the right choice, and that her baby was going to be okay. So what would have been 15 minutes, it turned out to be two hours we were together. And so they had to, um, the birth mom and her boyfriend had to leave because they had a movie to catch. And we had to go back to the hotel because we had to want to get some rest and get back from naps and all that good stuff. But before we were ready to leave, I, I remember saying to her, do you want to hold her? And she said, yes. So she did. And then she and her boyfriend, they went to their movie. And I think I changed Maddie's diaper, got in her car seat, and we went back to the hotel. So it was just such a moving time. I can't even verbalize how much the journey would maybe be so hard and so painful but yet time's so exciting and exhilarating because you know we knew it was on the other side. It was our beautiful daughter. And to, when it finally happens, it all makes sense. So my hope and my prayer is that as I shared this to you, and I know I was bopping around a little bit, that you can feel encouraged. And if you're a birth mom and you're just really not sure what to do, I can tell you, as an adoptive mom, your act of love, your selfless love of that baby who needs up for adoption, if you know you can't carry it or, I mean, raise it or be involved with its life, that selfless act of love of putting that baby up and you choosing that adoptive family, um, I, I can't express how blessed you'll make an adoptive family. You really are commended. And adoptive families out there, I'm telling you, your babies are out there. It's just about the timing. I heard that message so many times when we were waiting for our daughter. And then when to finally see it happen, it all made sense. And it will make sense. Just like we're waiting for our next one. And I know when time's right, it'll all happen. Just like with Maddie, this next one, it'll all make sense. Just like yours. So, if you're a birth mother or adopted parent and you need guidance, support, or encouragement, we have coaches here at Conduits of Love who are available. Please, please, please contact us at www.conduitsoflove.com. Click our Contact Us button. Again, we can't stress enough. Every child we believe 
deserves a lover, a loving forever family. It's all about the children. During our next podcast, or hopefully YouTube, but my sense it's going to be a podcast, we're going to have a birth mother's message. So I want to thank you for joining us. Please subscribe by hitting the subscribe button and hitting the bell right next to it to receive notifications. Please hit that like button if you like, and please share, please. I thank you for sharing. When you share, it really helps us deeply, not to mention the liking and the subscribing. So until next time, big blessings and thanks for joining us.